Manhunt by Raymond Williams The dark crouching figure ran clumsily across the ploughed field to the shelter of a solitary tree. He fell on his knees out of sheer exhaustion and clung to the rough bark with his wet hands. Perspiration trickled in little rivers down his burning face. His hair hung like black seaweed over his forehead. The moon crept out from behind a black cloud, shed some light sparingly on his trembling body, and slid back behind another black veil. God, don't you start showing your silly yellow face, he gasped, straining his eyes upwards to the night sky. He staggered to his feet, leaning heavily on the stout trunk. His prison clothes were ripped and filthy. He knew he could not afford to take too long a rest. He must keep going. They couldn't be too far behind him. A few faint yelps in the distance tightened his nerves. The dogs. They had the dogs on him now. He had seen them patrol in the prison grounds. Great black beasts with dirty yellow eyes which always watched you wherever you went. Long white teeth just waiting to sink themselves into your skin and rip you apart. He stumbled away from the tree in the opposite direction to the yelps. Dogs were so fast you just couldn't outrun them. They always outran foxes and stags and got them in the end. He was no match for a fox. Well, not in speed maybe, but in cunning. That was a different story. Yes, when it came to cunning, why he could teach the fox a thing or two. What about the cunning way he had lured June Kent back to his room just over two years ago? What about the way he had outmanoeuvred her, raped her, and finally killed her? Didn't it call for the cunning the way he had cut up her body and disposed of it piece by piece all over London? The old fox had a long way to go to catch up with him. A very long way to go. And then he couldn't help laughing as he remembered his final stroke of genius when the police finally caught him. He could still see the faces of the jury as he performed his madness act in court pretending to talk to little men on his own shoulder. His face split open with a delighted grin. And that bit when he told the judge that he had to obey the moon when it winked at him. The silence of the night was suddenly ripped open by his hysterical high-pitched fit of laughter. He was laughing too much to go on. He sank to the ground and rolled onto his back, laughing and panting. John Blandon, we find you guilty, but insane, he spouted in a deep voice. What a simple lot they were in that courtroom, guilty but insane. Little did they know how sane and cunning he really was. The smile vanished and the giggle died in his throat at the shrill bark in the distance. He had forgotten the dogs. He must pull himself together. It was dangerous to rest and dwell on his clever exploits. First things first. His main problem now was getting away from these savage brutes. Come on, Foxy, run, he said to himself to spur his mind back to his plight. He thrashed his way through the wet grass and sharp bushes, torturing his brain to find an escape. Suddenly he saw the weapon to beat the pursuing dogs. Water. Black running water. Once in the stream he could travel down with the current and find his way out onto the other bank, then let the dogs try and find him. Clever old foxy, you've done it again, he muttered. He lowered himself over the lip of the bank, into the gurgling stream. A sharp pain stabbed through his groin as he splashed in. Hell, this water's cold, he gasped. Then he was pulling strongly with the current along the twisting black valley. I wonder if foxes can swim, he thought. If they can, why don't they when the hounds are after them? Before he could answer himself, he saw a bright yellow light in the distance. Police torches, he thought immediately. But they couldn't have got this far already. Then, by straining his eyes in the direction of the light, he realised it was too large a mass of light for a torch. Could it be a window? The lighted window of a small cottage, perhaps? There was only one way to find out. He swam to the side and clawed his way from the swirling water up to the slimy mud bank. Inside the small kitchen, in the flickering light from the oil lamp, a middle-aged, white-haired woman was laying the table. She hummed to herself while her daughter scooped white steaming mounds of potato onto the two plates. I think we're just about ready, mother she said, tossing her shoulder-length blonde hair back with an automatic flick of the head, 
I'll just cut some bread then, dear. How many for you? Just one, thanks, she replied, setting the two steaming plates on the table. The cheerful face had stopped humming with the concentration of slicing with the long gleaming blade of a carving knife. We must get a bread knife next time we're in town, Pat, she said. I'm always frightened when I use this thing. She left the knife and loaf on the side table and took the white slices across to the other table. They both sat down and were just about to start when the door burst open and a grey blur flew to the side table, picked something up and turned to face them. Mother and daughter, both shrieking, were already up and cowering against the wall before the man spoke. Shut up and listen or I'll slit your noisy little throats. He stood there in a wet grey uniform with drips of water falling from his black hair. I'm on the run, see, and you're going to look after me until I'm ready to leave, and if you get any other ideas then you'll be arguing with this. He thrust the carving knife with a sharp jab through the air in their direction. He soon discovered that the cottage had a well-concealed cellar below the main room, a perfect hiding place when the guards came, which he knew was just a matter of time before they did. He had just finished bolting down some of their evening meal and changed his wet uniform for some old clothes found in a trunk when he spotted the round pools of flashing light approaching the cottage. He acted a quick mime of what would happen to Pat if her mother talked and disappeared down the wooden rungs to the cellar. With trembling hands and thumping heart, the mother closed the trap door lid, replaced the carpet and rocking chair on top and waited for the knock at the door. Below, in the pitch darkness of the cellar, John Blandon had Pat pinned between his body and the damp stone wall. His left hand was clasped over her mouth, while his right held the cold steel against her throat. The voices floated down to them from above. No, sir, I haven't seen anyone. I should keep all doors locked tonight, madam. It was a deep, stern voice. You see, this man's a mental case. Very dangerous. Oh, my goodness, what did he do? The voice was high-pitched with just a slight tremor. Well, ma'am, he, um... There was a nervous cough. He raped a young girl and killed her about two years ago. He felt Pat's body stiffen and press harder against the wall. Oh, my God, no, came the woman's voice from above. Nice girl she was from all accounts. The deep voice was continuing. Something Kent, her name was. Bits of her turned up all over London. So you see, you keep this door locked, lady, and don't look so worried. We'll get him before morning, never fear. After a few calls of good night, the footsteps faded and the door closed. John Blandon was still free. He grinned in the darkness and pressed his body hard against the girl. You heard what the man said, little girl, he purred. So you'd better be very nice to me tonight, hadn't you? He felt the girl's head nod in reply. When he was out of the cellar again, the carving knife waving, he ordered the women to take some old sacks and cushions to the cellar as their beds, while he would lie on the couch above. When they had gone below, he searched around the cottage. He found eleven pound, a gold watch, a dark blue overcoat, a pair of sunglasses and a pair of pyjama trousers. After pocketing the money, he undressed, put on the pyjama trousers and settled down on the couch with a few blankets over him and the knife close at hand. He lay back gazing at the dark shadows flickering on the roof above, thinking how cleverly he had got away when he heard a creak from the direction of the trap door. He shot up, grasping the knife tightly, but what he saw made his grip relax by degrees. Emerging from the cellar and coming towards him was Pat in a black negligee. Her face looked radiant in a lamplight with the golden tresses of her hair draped over her shoulders. Her firm, round breasts protruded sharply through the thin negligee, each neatly tipped with a darker shape. He gasped and stared in disbelief. It had been over two years now since he had seen a woman, and now this. Was he dreaming? Was he really here with this wonderful female beauty? Well, you did say I had to be nice to you, she said, cocking her head to one side as she spoke. He was still unable to speak when she reached his side. The moving body held him in a spell. He dropped the knife to the floor and with two huge hungry hands reached out to sample the tempting goddess. So intent were his eyes on drinking in the beauty, while his hands ravaged across the smooth soft flesh, that he did not notice the goddess raise her right arm with a dark green bottle in it or bring it down swiftly towards his head. 
but he felt the blow on his left temple and had a vague recollection of tinkling glass as the warm breath slipped from his hands and he fell into a deep pool of darkness. His head ached, his eyes hurt when he opened them. He groaned and tried to move but couldn't. As feeling began to seep back into his numb body, he realised he was tied down hard to the top of the kitchen table. He was unable to move an arm or leg. Above him he saw the two faces of mother and daughter just watching him and saying nothing. What did you... He began as his head cleared. So you're awake, are you, Mr. John Murder and Blandon? It was the white-haired mother who spoke, her green eyes glinting at him. So you thought you'd got away with rape and murder? Now just a minute, he started. I'll do a deal with you. We don't do deals with you, do we, Pat? No, mother, not with him. He looked at the other face. It also looked hard and full of hate. Are you ready, Pat? Ready when you are, mother. Right. Now he's awake, we'll start. He felt a sharp thrill shock his body as Pat's smooth fingers undid his clothes. Then the room shook with his screams as he saw the mother holding the long carving knife in her hand. The knife vanished from his view and his scream reached a higher pitch as he felt a violent gnawing pain. His scream was continuous as the carving knife sawed back and forth in the strong determined hands. Then with the pain scorching through his body until he was on the verge of collapse, he saw the red bladed knife again. Why? Why? Oh why? He croaked, appealingly. Why? I'll tell you why, spat back the older woman. Because it was my daughter June you debauched with your filthy body. My precious lamb you hacked apart and packed into bloody parcels. Well, you won't rape any more girls now as long as you live.